test this and let us begin with the sound okay Okay, this morning we're going to continue with our study. Um, we were uh, doing the reform line of Christ and we finished here at the baptism. And we were showing how um, when Christ was born, right here at the time of the end, it was paralleling the birth of Moses who was the type. We were looking at this, Moses being the Alpha Christ being the omega, the first and the last, the natural, the spiritual, the type and the anti-type. So Moses, Moses, who was a deliverer, excuse me, uh, Moses, who is a deliverer, is typifying Christ, who is a, a, a deliverer in his birth year, just like Moses, marking the beginning of the reform line. And we saw that Prior to that point, the, the, they were in darkness and captivity, marked by the mingling of the, the two seeds, this mixing of truth with error, typified by intermarrying with unbelievers. And it led them into darkness, which leads them into captivity. And we have the same illustration here in the time of Christ, that the Jews were in darkness, they had mingled truth with error, and they did not know God anymore. And therefore, when Christ was born, light comes into the world to dispel the darkness. They were in captivity to Rome, prefigured by this captivity to Egypt. But unlike how Christ was coming here to deliver them from the Egyptian bondage, we understand Christ was here coming here to deliver them from their sin, because this is the natural captivity, this is the, the spiritual captivity, but because of their sin, it brought them into captivity. So at the end of the world, we're also in captivity in, into the chains of this world, but Christ is coming to deliver us from our sin. This is what will, will set us free. This is what causes us to be in literal captivity. So we must comprehend the difference between the natural and, and the spiritual. And there was a death decree against Moses right here, and there was a death decree against Christ right here. And we'll talk more about that uh, uh, as we go through. This one was marked by a, a new pharaoh uh, uh, arising, and then we also have this one here marking by another new pharaoh. We were shown that these were both representing the, the same thing. And at the time of the end, when the light comes, it brings an increase of knowledge on the subject that's uh, at hand. Here it was about the, their deliverance from Egypt, and here, it was about the, uh, the subject of the prophecies of the Messiah coming, the last week of Christ. And he was to be with them for uh, three and a half years from the baptism. And we looked at that. John was raised up. He's the messenger that paralleled Moses here. Was raised up to give a message pointing forward to the beginning of the, the last week. And it's more specifically down to the midst of the week where he would be cut off, pointed to the cross. We saw that just like the um, Moses uh, who had to circumcise his son, it was life or death to do it. It's also life or death to receive this baptism. And the baptism is typifying a combination of the human and the divine, right? It's, uh, and it's life or death to receive the message that this uh, Christ brought right here. Christ is typifying his people, just like Moses was bringing a message there, Christ was bringing a message. And in this illustration, this whole line was based upon the precepts of God. And the Lord was showing Moses right there that if you fail to keep a precept, that you would, you would die, right? So it was life or death to keep the law of God, and it was life or death here to receive the message. But these are both really teaching the same thing, just from two different angles. Okay, the circumcision being a type of baptism. The, 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 the Christ coming down here, Christ literally came down, but here typifying Christ being illustrated through the Holy Spirit by this dove, because Christ was on earth in the flesh, but he's typifying his people. So... 
Literally, Christ comes down. Spiritually, the Holy Spirit comes down to aid Christ in his work of salvation. Okay, so that's where we got up to. So the next way mark that we had here was this first miracle. So, uh, but just before we do that, I was just mentioning that the theme there was the precepts of God. What I want us to understand here is that when, when Christ came to the earth, the theme that he was portraying right here was the natural to the spiritual because this is the alpha. It's the natural pointing to the spiritual. Christ was illustrating this, right? Um, you, you see this in, in Matthew chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. It says, All these things speak Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable speak he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. And in Psalm 17 and verse 2, it says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. So Christ took parables or, or thing, he was comparing, the, 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 taking the natural things to teach them spiritual lessons. So Christ was always trying to, to teach them spiritual things. He said, for instance, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And it was not literal. He was trying to point them to the spiritual. He says, tear down this temple and in three days I will build it up. Speaking about himself, not the literal temple. But the Jews always were thinking in a literal mentality. Okay, so... Um, we, we have to understand it just like Nicodemus, and we'll speak a bit about this when we go through this. He says, um, unless a man be born again. And Nicodemus' mindset was to say, how can a man be born when he's old? So it's illustrating the mindset of God's people. They're always trying to read the Bible as a book, looking at it literal, uh, literal understanding. But Christ came to show them that he was the Alpha and the Omega, and he wanted you to see the spiritual understanding, not the, the literal. The literal here, or the, or the historical, the typical, was pointing forward to the spiritual, and it's the spiritual that can save you. Moses couldn't save you. He was only a type. He was only a type of a deliverer. The deliverance from Egypt won't save you from physical Egypt. You have to be delivered from your sin. And this is what this is teaching. So, the theme of here was the law of God. And the theme here was the, the natural to the spiritual. Christ spoke to them in parables. So, let's now look and see this first miracle. It says, um, Ministry of Healing, page 356, He who gave Eve to Adam as a helpmeet performed his first miracle at a marriage festival. In the festival hall where friends and kindred rejoiced together, Christ began his public ministry. So, <coughs> Christ comes to the, the marriage of Cana, right? And he performs this miracle by turning these water pots into wine. Now, all these illustrations, they have great significance, but I'm not trying to go into the, the relevance of these things. All I'm trying to do is show the parallel that Moses came here to the elders and he gave them this first miracle. And I want to see that right here there's also this first miracle. And you'll see as we bring all these lines together, the relevance of what this is showing. Why, why is it important to understand that there's this first miracle? And what does it point to? So, um, I'm just going to write here this marriage. And it was the first miracle. <coughs> okay. Now, on top of that, uh, from Christian Service 118, it says, With the calling of John and Andrew and Simon, of Philip and Nathaniel, that's five, began the foundation of the Christian church. So, something else has been linked to this first miracle right here, and you'll see 
how it points to these other lines that we will come forward because it's saying that these five disciples and it was these five disciples that he took to this marriage feast okay so when he called his first five disciples he takes them to the marriage feast and he says that's the foundation of the christian faith so it's marking a foundation right here now a point i want you to to understand is in these reform lines not every single way mark is exactly the same and that's very purposeful because some things are showing you two different things but they're the same way mark and you'll see how they come together later on so it's not always like a, a, a sometimes you've got to look and think well, why is this different to this but it, but it doesn't matter it will become clear uh, as we go through um, <clears throat> so and you'll see that now because in this illustration, when we came to Egypt, it was Moses was coming before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh was, uh, was about the Sabbath issue, and we had all this here showing that we were paralleling this with uh, with Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, showing to come out of Babylon, come out of Egypt, showing that Pharaoh and Babylon were the same thing, and it followed by a manifestation of God's power, right, which manifested in these ten plagues, the first three marking this finger of God where the strongest evidence was given followed by seven plagues leading down to the Passover so right here we're not going to see ten plagues right it's not the same but we're going to see something different that is showing a different uh, this, this uh, another line of truth that's relevant to this right you have to look very closely at these things and we're, let's look at that now we shall see so um, after his first miracle, um, it says in John chapter 2, verse 13 to 15, it says that the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sin. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple. And the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changes money and overthrew the tables so at the first Passover, the, the first passover that christ was alive right so what i want us to understand from his baptism to this passover was six months the christ was in ministry for three and a half years so from his baptism to the cross it's three and a half years so what I want to see is we're going to go from Passover to Passover, which is a period of three years. So it was three years here that he was uh, ministering from, from this point to this point. And at this first Passover, he goes up and there's a separation takes place. He goes into the temple and cleanses the temple. And many people flee from that temple, right? So you have the first temple cleansing that I'm going to, going to mark right here. So the question you can ask yourself, I'll just put a box around this so that we know that this is separate from, from this. The question you want to ask yourself is, what relevance does, does this temple cleansing have to this way mark right here? Well, let, let's look. Let's begin with this quote from Second Selected Message 118. Uh, paragraph one it says the prophet says i saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was light with his glory and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying babylon the great has fallen has fallen and has become the habitation of devils this is the same message that was given by the second angel babylon has fallen because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication what is that wine her false doctrines she hath given to the world a false sabbath instead of the sabbath of the fourth commandment so babylon has fallen its reference in a false sabbath we know right here that this was a sabbath issue right and has repeated the falsehood that satan first told eve in eden the natural immortality of the soul many kindred errors she has spread far and wide teaching for doctrines the commandments of men she then goes on to say when jesus 
began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from its sacrilegious profanation. So right here, she's likened, she's talking, first of all, talking about Babylon being fallen, about this Roman doctrine. And then she says, when Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from its sacrilegious profanation. Among the last acts of his ministry was the second cleansing of the temple. So just let me mark that one here. So you have two temple cleansings, Passover to Passover, right? One, two, three years, right? So when Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from his sacrilegious profanation. Among the last acts of his ministry was the second cleansing of the temple. So in the last work for the warning of the world, Two distinct calls are made to the churches. So she's paralleling these two temple cleansings with two distinct calls at the end of the world. And the first call is, the second angel's message is, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. We just read Babylon is fallen was about the false doctrine about the Sabbath. And we'll read more about that in a minute. That great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of a fornication. And... In the loud cry of the third angel's message, he voices heard from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Now, I was showing you this the other day that you have these messages, right? You have the first message, second message, third message. And this is right here. It's paralleling these two temple cleansings with the second angel's message and the third angel's message. So you can see how already it's giving you information about how these lines are, are, are the same. This would be the first, second, third. Okay? Or the points where those messages are confirmed. So let's just confirm this. The, this she's paralleling the first temple cleansing with the message Babylon has fallen. Let's read this next quote from Signs of the Times, June 12, 1893. The prophet says, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lined with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye receive not of uh, that ye be not a partaker of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. When do her sins reach unto heaven? When the law of God is finally made void by legislation, then the extremity of God's people is his opportunity to show who is the governor of heaven and earth. As a satanic power is stirring up the elements from beneath, God will send light and power to his people that the message of truth may be proclaimed to all the world. So right here she's marking this first temple cleansing with the Sabbath issue, right? Paralleling. Moses standing before Pharaoh about the Sabbath issue. So we can see you have a, a perfect parallel. So although it's been illustrated through two different things happening, it's showing you the same truth. And there's a reason for that when we bring them together right this is why we have to look at these things very closely not to be so narrow-minded where we want, want a, a, something that's perfectly that, that's you know it was an orange here we want to see an orange here and a banana here we want to see a banana here it's not like that it's showing you this the same work being done uh, in, in different ways this is illustrating the law of God and it's illustrating the types and it's through uh, uh, a historical event and this is the anti-type taught through a completely different way but they are the same and this is what we must look closely at to understand that God's dealing with man is ever the same he's always going through the same steps just using different illustrations to show us the same plan of salvation and we're going to have to bring all those together in order to understand our time now <coughs> I want us to um, understand that in Spod McGann 1.4 it says, I saw that the two-horned beast had a dragon's mouth and that 
his power was in his head and the decree would go out of his mouth. So this is speaking about the United States, who is the dragon power, right? So the Sunday law decree is going to be made by the United States. So here, we're marking here, there's a new pharaoh arises and makes a decree to, to kill God's people. Another new pharaoh arises and he also makes this, uh, oppresses God's people it's about the, the Sabbath issue. And I want to show that they're the same thing. And remember, we were looking at Nebuchadnezzar right here, makes this golden image and she likens it unto the Assyrian. And Pharaoh was this Assyrian. And we've shown that the call out of Egypt is the call out of Babylon. Babylon has fallen, come out of Babylon. It's the Sunday law issue, right? And I want to see that already these two times marking the Sunday law are already put in place. Right at the beginning here, you have Christ as a, as when he's born as a death decree comes against him, the same as Moses. And right here again, you have this Sabbath issue. So it is about, it's this dragon's mouth, the United States, that's going to make this, this decree. So I want us to see that each time here, it's marking a work that the United States is going to do. This is what is being prefigured. Now we just go to Great Controversy 438. It says, the line of prophecy in which these symbols are found begins with Revelation 12, with the dragon that sought to destroy Christ at his birth. So who thought to destroy Christ at his birth? It was the, the dragon, right? The dragon is said to be Satan. He it was that moved upon Herod to put the Savior to death. But the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman Empire in which paganism was the prevailing religion. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is in a secondary sense a symbol of pagan Rome. So, pagan Rome right here, uh, which was represented through Herod, who's a king, right, is representing the dragon. I want us to see that the dragon represents the state powers. The United States is the one that's going to make this decree, and the United States is a state power. Okay, the, 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 the papacy is outside of the scope of this at this point. They are behind the scenes. But I want us to see that it's the state powers that's going to make the decree at the end of the world. So in Ezekiel 29 and verse 3, it says, Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the Pharaoh king of Egypt, the great dragon. So what's it saying about Pharaoh? He's a dragon, right? The dragon because he's the one that's making this decree to kill God's people, right? Oppressing God's people. It's this dragon-like spirit. And the United States is, begins as a lamb that is going to speak as a dragon, right? When it persecutes and makes this Sunday law. And that's why Pharaoh is likened to a dragon. What about Nebuchadnezzar? In Jeremiah 51 verse 34 it says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, hath devoured me. He hath crushed me, he hath made me an empty vessel. He hath swallowed me up like a dragon. He hath filled his belly with my delicates. He hath cast me out. So Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, is also likened unto a dragon. The dragon is Satan. It's the state powers, the kings of the earth, that he uses to, to carry out his persecutions upon God's people. And it confirms that right here in Testimonies to Ministers 38. Kings and rulers and governors have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon who goes to make war with the saints, with those who keep the commandments of God and who have the faith of Jesus. In their enmity against the people of God, they show themselves guilty also of the choice of Barabbas instead of Christ. So, right here, Pharaoh, two Pharaohs, they are the dragon, right? And then you have this uh, temple cleansing here. It's marking a, a, a Sabbath issue. It's parallel to Babylon. It's fallen, come out of Babylon. Babylon is also a dragon. And it's teaching us something about the United States. And we saw here that pagan Rome is also likened unto the dragon. They're all an illustration of this persecution 
that's coming upon God's people at the end of the world. Now, if we go to Desire of Ages 686, it says, As Christ felt his unity with the Father broken up, he feared that in his human nature he would be unable to endure the coming conflict with the powers of darkness. In the wilderness of temptation, the destiny of the human race had been at stake. Christ was then conqueror. Now the tempter had come for the last fearful struggle. For this he had been preparing during the three years of Christ's ministry. So Christ's ministry was for three years, from Passover to Passover. This right here is a time of preparation, right? It's important that we, we see that. So really from Passover to Passover, that's where he was doing his, his work. She has a quote where she says, when he cleansed the temple, Christ was announcing his work to cleanse the human heart of every defilement. So this was what he came to do to free us from our sin. So from here to here, he was teaching the people about the plan of salvation and he was going to cleanse them from their sin, cleanse their evil hearts. And in Luke 13, in verse 7, it says, Then said he unto the dresser of this vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none, cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? So there's a second witness marking these three years he comes to find fruit, right? First six months from the baptism to the first temple cleansing is a preparation. So it's important we correctly understand these things so that later on when we bring them together they will make more sense. Now, the next way Mark is marking this the strongest evidence and um, <clears throat> right here it was marked by the, 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 the Lord demonstrating to them his power that, that these magicians could not counterfeit it. But uh, right here uh, <clears throat> the greatest evidence was illustrated by the, the raising of Lazarus. Right? The raising of Lazarus it was this last great miracle that he did. And he did it before them all in such a way that it could not be controverted that he was the Messiah. And he, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Let us read about it. It says, Desire of Ages 5.29 In delaying to come to Lazarus, Christ had a purpose of mercy towards those who had not received him. He tarried that by raising Lazarus from the dead, he might give to his stubborn, unbelieving people another evidence that he was indeed the resurrection and the life. He was loath to give up all hope to the people, of the people, the poor wandering sheep of the house of Israel. His heart was breaking because of their impenitence. In his mercy, he purposed to give them one more evidence that he was the restorer, the one who alone could bring life and immortality to light. This was to be an evidence that the priests could not misinterpret. This was the reason of his delay in going to Bethany. This crowning miracle, the raising of Lazarus, was to set the seal of God on his work and on his claim to divinity. So, let's put here Lazarus, raising of Lazarus, it was the strongest evidence. But in conjunction with that, let's um, what 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 did the Lord do when He raised Lazarus? Well, it says here in Desire of Ages five seventy two, those whom His voice had awakened from the sleep of death were in that throng. Okay, so Christ, the raising of Lazarus was when He said, "Lazarus, wake up." And this is very important because Sister White <coughs> is going to parallel the raising of Lazarus to the midnight cry, when the virgins wake up. And it says here, those with whom his voice had awakened from the sleep of death were in that throng. Lazarus, whose body had seen corruption in the grave, but who now rejoiced in the strength of glorious manhood, led the beast on which the Saviour rode. So the crowning miracle, Lazarus, takes the, the ass upon which Christ is riding in the triumphal entry, which goes from here all the way up to this point, it's marking this, this, 
this rebuke to them that he was now proclaiming himself as king when he, he, he did this right right here. So you also have the, just put TE for triumphal entry. Lazarus is leading that, uh, that beast. And of course the triumphal entry was a manifestation of God's power, right? Just like these plagues were a manifestation of his power. So we mentioned the second temple cleansing, so let's look at that now. It says, um, this is from Review and Herald, December 23rd, 1890. On the crest of Olivet, as he beheld the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, here he paused. He was loath to utter the irrevocable sentence, O oh, that Jerusalem would repent, when the fast westering sun should pass out of sight, her day of mercy would be ended. So, Christ is riding the ass, Lazarus is leading, he's riding all the way up here. And as long as the, the sun was up, she still had a day of mercy. It says, but, but Jesus closed his sentence, but now they are hid from thine eyes. On another occasion, he lamented the impenitence of the chosen city. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. The Lord forbid that this scene should now be repeated in the experience of God's professed people. My spirit, he says, shall not always strive with man. So it's parallel in the destruction of Jerusalem with the flood. The time will come when it must be said of the impenitent, Ephraim is joined to his idols, let him alone. So it's marking when, when Christ, in the triumphal entry, comes up here and cleanses the temple the second time, it's marking the close of probation, at least for those that had rejected him at, at this point. But it's paralleling right here, which was the close of probation for Egypt, because right here at the Passover, the firstborn was, was slain. Now it says here in John 19, verses 14 and 15, And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. And it goes on to say in Patriarchs and Prophets 539, On the fourteenth day of the month, at even, the Passover was celebrated. Its solemn impressive ceremonies commemorating the deliverance from bondage in Egypt and pointing forward to the sacrifice that should deliver from the bondage of sin. So the Passover in Egypt was pointing forward to the Passover where Christ would go on the cross to deliver his people from sin. Now notice here, when on the Passover, when they came out of Egypt, it was marking a birth where they were delivered. And here it's marking the cross, the deliverance from sin. So I want us to look and see how that, how does that point to a birth? Well, in John chapter 3, verses 3 to 5, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, speaking to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Nicodemus had seen Christ cleanse the temple the first time, and he came to him by night and was asking him, because he was convicted he was the Messiah. And Christ gave him this, unless a man be born again. And he's trying to get us to understand that this is a birth. Now if you look closely, right, circumcision is a type of birth. Same as baptism. So you have a birth here, birth here, birth here, birth here. And Christ had just cleansed the temple for the first time. And he comes to him and says, unless a man be born again. And he's pointing forward to the cross, right? I want to see that there's really, excuse me, that there's, a, there's a birth at every way, because this is the Passover, and this is the Passover, uh, Passover. And it's teaching us something about the plan of salvation, which we cover later, but I just want to put these things in place. And 
In verse 4 it says, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? So Nicodemus was thinking in literal lines. But then Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, which he was right here, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So, he's pointing him to this second birth. The second birth was marking where you're born of the Spirit. And Christ said to his disciples, Can ye drink of the cup that I will drink of? And he says, Yes. And he says, Yes, you, you will drink it. You can show that that cup, when he's in Gethsemane, he says, Not my will be done, but thy will. And he agreed to drink of the cup. And the cup was when he went to the cross. And just a few lines down in John chapter 3 it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Okay? So this cup that Christ had to drink, he says, Can ye be baptized with the baptism that I am to be baptized with? And he says, Yes, Lord. Right? This cup, the cross, was this baptism of the Spirit. There's many, many things that we can understand from that. But there's two births, right? And in this illustration, it's, it was pointed back to this first birth here, which is this baptism by water, and pointing to this second birth here. But there's many, many things that we can understand from that as we progress. But I just want you to understand that it's pointing to the cross, is a birth where they're going to be delivered from their sin. Birth deliverance, birth where they get delivered, right? Passover, Passover. So you can see that there's overwhelming evidence to show through all these principles the natural points to the spiritual, the Alpha and Omega, and how Moses, the type of Christ, points to Christ, and how these steps that are taken down through the everlasting gospel, which is the three angels' messages, which is the history of the seven thunders, these seven waymarks, right, pointing down to, to the end of the world. So there's much we have to understand from this, and we have to look at these things very closely, but it's really pointed to the end of the world, to our, our experience that we uh, because of our mingling truth with error, mingling with the, the nations and intermarrying and all these things, it's brought us into darkness and captivity. And Christ wants to free us from that, right? He wants to free us, and it's going to be through a message of truth. It's going to be brought through a messenger, right? And he's going to take us down uh, through this. So in order to understand that, we have to bring all these things together, and they're going to point down to our time, and they're going to show us where we are, not, not by time, but by these events as they, they come in order. So I pray that this is a blessing and uh, let us close. In Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the simple illustrations that you give us, line upon line, precept upon precept. Thank you for this truth, the Alpha and Omega, and how it's going to really help to open up your word and bring all the scriptures together, how every prophet is speaking about the end of the world, and how all these stories are pointed down to this last great event, the Sunday of Crisis. And I pray that you'll help us as we go through these studies, that the people that are watching have an open mind and not try to get frustrated because there's many unanswered things. But trust and wait and pray and see that many of these things will all come together and they'll be so beautiful and so perfect. And we'll know that this is a message specifically can only have come from you. And no man is able to bring these things together in such a way. And we just thank you, dear Lord, for your loving care for us. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.